Um, while we're uh, waiting for the slides to come up, let me just uh, welcome you and uh, briefly introduce myself. I'm Dr. Arlen Myers. I'm the president and CEO of the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs. We're a global biomedical and clinical innovation and entrepreneurship network. And our mission is to help people like you get your ideas to patients. So, and if you're interested in learning more, just send me an email or I included my LinkedIn profile on the, on the chat. Um, so lately, uh, and I've been noticing and uh, reading that, you know, more and more healthcare professionals and uh, it's a two-sided coin uh, technologists are interested in doing uh, what I call sick care side gigs. Um, uh, in the healthcare side, um, uh, a lot of uh, not just physicians, but physicians assistants and other healthcare providers for a number of reasons are looking to either expand what they're doing or replace what they're doing in clinical medicine pivot, whether that's a side gig or actually something that results in a full-time job. So basically what we're talking about are people that do advising, consulting, chief medical officers, um, that sort of thing. And there are a lot of issues when healthcare providers or start their own AI company. And the same, it applies actually to what I call non sick care entrepreneurs. That is technologists or people that have a business or a technology background with little or no sick care domain expertise. And let me just parenthetically say that I call the US healthcare system a sick care system because it's really not a healthcare system. It's, you know, we spend 3.7 trillion on 96% of that is on taking care of sick people. We really don't spend a heck of a lot on public health or disease prevention, which has been evidenced by what we're seeing in COVID. So for the time being, at least, the idea is we're, we're trying to transform or translate sick care into healthcare, but it's gonna take a while, but things like what we're doing here, I think is a step in the right direction. So anyway, that's what I thought I would go over a couple of things, but more importantly, I really want this to be a conversation. So if you have questions or issues, or how do I do this, or I don't know what to do next, or how do I find these people, then I, I would really like to engage you and, and have that conversation. So if you have a question, ask it in the Q&A, and then uh, Matt or Sean can relay it, and we can discuss it. So if we go to the next slide, I also gave you some prior reading, so hopefully this will be a sort of a flipped classroom kind of thing, but so I, in my experience doing this on both sides as a physician entrepreneur and someone who now participates in various consulting, advisory roles, management roles, et cetera, uh, here's what I've learned and, and, and I'm sharing it with you. And, and I would preface it again by saying that uh, as in clinical medicine, uh, clinical judgment comes from experience and experience comes from mistakes. And it's the same thing in entrepreneurship. So you really don't learn this stuff until you make the mistake. So hopefully I can help you avoid them. Um, so the, the most common things that I see when people are trying to pivot or, or get involved in non sick care, in a sick care or a non clinical gig is uh, their, their knowledge, skills, abilities, and competencies are not up to snuff and, and therefore they're really not able to contribute value. Uh, the second, and we can go through each of these. I just want a specific one you wanna discuss, then, then we can do that or all of them, it's really up to you. Um, uh, particularly physicians, but other people have an unrealistic income and job expectation. The third is that they simply don't acknowledge that they don't know what they don't know. And therefore they have not just knowledge blind spots, but they have emotional blind spots more importantly, or character or personality or mindset blind spots. And we can talk about the difference between all those if you'd like. Uh, they just figure that since they have 
you know, their, their degrees and the initials after their name that they really don't need a plan. They can just make it known that they're looking for something to do and somebody's going to call them up and say, great, I'm going to hire you. But unfortunately, it doesn't work out that way. There's a difference between being a doctor and by doctor, I would also include PhD or a scientist or an engineer um, and a physician, scientist, engineer, entrepreneur. They're, they're two different things. The, the clinical or the scientific mindset is really different than the entrepreneurial mindset. Um, they play in the wrong sandbox. In other words, they don't pick their spot right. And there's a big difference between, for example, being involved in biopharma versus digital health or care delivery. And, and we can get into all the issues there. As I mentioned, there's a difference between the clinical and the entrepreneurial mindset. And there's a bunch of mindset mistakes. And we can talk about what is a mindset. Um, but there's a bunch of mistakes that people make when, when they're trying to develop this. Um, next slide. Um, uh, since a lot of people sort of get into this without really understanding the landscape or the lay of the land, they figure, well, I can just hire somebody to or find somebody to help me, uh, which is a good idea. Uh, there is a difference, though, between a sponsor, a mentor, a coach, um, or, or an advisor. And you may get the wrong person, or you may not actually be ready to be coached. So that's another issue where you figure, well, I'll just have somebody pay me or, or I'll pay them to do it. But it, unfortunately, it doesn't work. And then the last one I would mention is, and, and this is part of a, a long list, but I just wanted to headline a couple of them. Um, quitting your day job too early or more importantly, quitting too late. So I want to stop there. And since again, I want if is there one of these that you have an interest in elaborating, my elaborating on, or have you had experience with this? Are you interested in sharing it? What have been the problems you've encountered? And is this an, a topic of interest? So why don't we wait for a few seconds to um, see whether anyone has any questions that they can uh, post on the Q and A uh, slot. And, and I believe, Dr. Myers, everybody has the ability to unmute themselves in this um, oh, lunch session, so they can just unmute and go ahead and ask at this time. Uh, let's do, yeah, let's do that. That would be even better if you could just unmute yourself and ask your introduce yourself and who you are what you do and and what is your question i really want to make this more like an office hours kind of thing hi arlen uh can you hear me this is ian bet hi ian uh could you hi. tell us about yourself and who you are and where you are sure um sorry the video my video is not coming through, but I'm a family medicine physician in uh, yep. Columbus, Ohio. Yep. Uh, I'm an employed physician. So yep. I, I do, I do really appreciate all the pitfalls that you just pointed out there. My question is I'm not looking to move outside of what I'm currently doing because I really enjoy my job, yep. um, educating and taking care of patients. But my question is more about doing things, uh, on my own, uh, I guess side gig is how that would be described, but not having it interfere with my employment or having my ideas used by my employer without um, my consent or them thinking that I developed them because I was their employee. Right. So those are, th what I'm hearing are three separate questions. One is, how do I get involved in this without it in interfering with my day job? Or maybe two. Um, and the second is, uh, how do I do this without my employer stealing my idea? Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So the first is, um, um, 
how do you get involved without this getting in the way of your day job? So uh, there are many there are many different roles. First of all, um, there are many different roles that you can play as a physician interested in. And for the sake of this conversation, let's just confine it to digital health. We we could talk about there. there biopharma, medical device, digital health, digital therapeutics, care delivery innovation, medical education technologies, FinTech, SynTech, you know, there's lots and lots of places you could play. But let's just confine it because we're talking about AI as a subsegment of digital health. Let's just confine it to digital health. So as an example, you want somehow to get involved with a digital health company. It could be a startup. It could be a scale up. It could be a grown up. It could be everything from two people with a patent on a wall to Google. And somehow you you would like to get involved. Um, so the next step would be that if that's the area that you're interested in, then you kind of have to explore different roles. And um, and I call this roles, holes, and goals. So the role is there's lots of different ways to add value as a physician to a digital health enterprise. And incidentally, we're talking about enterprises that are outside of your employment. In other words, there's a difference between, between an entrepreneur outside and an intrapreneur. In other words, working in your health facility to do something. But let's just say you want to work outside of that because we could talk about entrepreneurship as well. And so the first thing is that uh, you got to pick your spot and that role could be um, as an advisor. It could be as a consultant. It could be as a key opinion leader or special or a subject matter expert or domain expert. Um, it could be as a voice of the customer. Um, you said you were a hospitalist? No, I'm a family medicine physician. Family medicine doctor. Okay. Right. Predominantly outpatient, but I do work on the inpatient side as well. Okay. So let's say some outside company needs a family medicine doc to ask them XYZ. Let's just say care coordination platform, of which there are many, many evolving. So they want a, somebody like you who knows inside baseball. Can you give us your opinion? about what we're thinking. And that's a very one time, one off, you arrange any sort of compensation or whatever. And we just wanna interview you for 20 minutes or a half an hour to get your opinion about what we have in mind. Or it could be, you know what, we really want more than that. And there's many, many different things that you can do. So my point is there are different roles you can play. And when I say, uh, holes and goals. Uh, holes mean what problem are you trying to, to fix? What hole are you trying to fill? Because you may not have any interest in care coordination. You may have an interest in um, remote patient monitoring or patient reported outcomes or care, uh, caregiver uh, collaboration. I mean, there's a million different things you get involved in. Um, or med ed tech or whatever it happens to be. So you have to satisfy and understand what you're interested in. Um, and then the goals are, uh, what, what is your goal? I mean, what are you trying to accomplish by doing this? Is it something that, well, it's plan B. I mean, even though you are an employed physician, no one has job security these days. And I say that as someone who, was, and in some respects, still am an employed physician as an academic surgeon at the University of Colorado. So nobody is, has job security. And all you have to do is look at the numbers in COVID. Doctors getting fired, not making the numbers, being disruptive. And I don't care whether you're tenured or not tenured. That's just a name. So some folks are saying, well, I need plan B because I just really don't know what's going to happen. I like what I'm doing now. I like seeing patients, et cetera, et cetera. But it's always good to have plan B and to plan for it before you need it. 
So that's the point, roles, holes, and goals. What are you trying to accomplish by working outside? Now, your second point, and I can't answer that, obviously, you have to answer that. The second point is, so how do you protect your idea? The, the headline is, particularly when you become an employed physician, one of the biggest mistakes you can make is not reading your employment contract and understanding the terms and conditions. And this applies to academic medicine, but the whole tech transfer thing is a different conversation. Let's just talk about the employed physician. So when you sign an employment contract, the usual things are, how much you're gonna pay me? Do I have to take call? What are the benefits? What about night call, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Usually that has to do with salary and benefits. Of course, there are other things you're gonna discuss, like what am I supposed to do? What are my responsibilities, et cetera? But unfortunately, what often is omitted or not discussed or understood in the contract is intellectual property. So if I come up with an idea as your employer, employee rather, what are the terms and conditions whereby I can do something with that? And there's a difference between um, Life, you know, uh, what you do or monetizing an idea and who owns it. But the fundamental question is who owns the idea that I come up with? And that will vary from place to place. For example, you're, you're a family physician as an employed doctor in a large integrated delivery network. But you decide that um, you're going to come up with a gadget to help people from falling in the shower. So you sketch it on a napkin, you fool around with it. Maybe you got a friend who you know, can give you some idea and you patent it. Well, who owns that idea? Is it your employer or is it you? And fund versus you come up with an, a, uh, a patient care platform that uses artificial intelligence and you're, you're gonna develop this platform that you want to commercialize and sell. You don't want to just use it inside your hospital. So you're doing everything that we're talking about in this conference and you get involved, but you're using patients that you see to inform the data. You're using technologies, computers, software, storage, people, whatever. It's usually referred to as substantial resources. So if you are using your employer's substantial resources, it's likely not necessarily guaranteed that they're gonna say, wait a minute, you did this on our time. You used our stuff. You used our people. We own the idea. So the, the answer is it depends. And my advice to you is that if you're thinking of doing something or inventing something, get that squared away before you tell anybody about it. Great. Yeah, that's very, very helpful on both of those points. I really appreciate your perspective. Thank you. Sure. Harlan, there is a question in the Q&A. You want me to just read it? Yeah, would you? Okay. Given that employee day jobs have become so busy, how do we achieve the balance between continuing the day job and learning the skills to navigate career change? So that's a good question. We all have 24 hours in a day. We all have, you know, family, professional, personal commitments. Um, and so what I would tell you is the following. Uh, what you will need to, to pursue this line of work, that is non-clinical career. Now, I'm talking about entrepreneurial gigs. And generally, these side gigs fall into three categories. One is um, a clinical gig that is not a full-time job. So for example, locums, um, part-time work, fill-in, traveling work, that kind of thing. You're, you're taking care of patients. You're just not doing it on a predetermined regular W-2 schedule. That's not what we're talking about in this particular segment. The second is um, you wanna get involved in a side gig that does not involve face-to-face -face or virtual seeing patients, but does involve some aspect of managing the sick care system, utilization management, second opinions, utilization review, 
et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Medical legal work. We're not talking about that in this segment. The third one is the entrepreneurial side gig, which is what I'm referring to. And incidentally, entrepreneurship is not confined to just creating a company. Rather, my definition is the pursuit of opportunity under volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous so-called VUCA conditions with the goal of creating stakeholder-defined value through the deployment of innovation using a viable business model. Now, that's a complicated, wordy definition with a bunch of elements, but that's the ultimate goal is to create user or stakeholder-defined value, one of which is the patient, but as we all know, in sick care, there are multiple stakeholders. So that's what you're attempting to do. Now, in order to do that, if you are a technologist, engineer, or health professional, my, my general assumption is you don't, you weren't, you do what you do, but you weren't trained to do entrepreneurship. That's part of the reason we created the Society of Physician Entrepreneurs is to fill that gap. So what do you need? The first is you need to recognize that you don't know what you don't know. So, I mean, you know a lot about science, you know a lot about data, you know a lot about whatever specialty you're in in medicine, but you probably don't know a whole lot about business development and how all this works. So that's the first thing. So good for you. The first step in curing a disease is admitting you have it. So now you recognize that you need to kind of fill in some gaps. And basically those gaps are gonna be education, resources, networks, mentors, experience, peer-to-peer support, and non-clinical entrepreneurial career guidance. Most of those things, if I'd say 80% of those things you can get on nights and weekends when you're not taking care of patients. Education, you can get up the yin-yang, like programs like this for free on the internet. So you should start reading about and beginning to understand understand the lingo and the language of tech transfer, business development, healthcare commercialization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Secondly, you should build your networks. Most people, particularly scientists, engineers, and doctors have very limited networks and the networks they have are usually within their own domain. If you're a family medicine doc, you probably have a bunch of friends who are family medicine docs maybe a couple of ENT surgeons, but not a whole lot of technologists or website developers. So you need to expand your networks and there's a lots of different ways you can do that and we can get into that. Um, you need um, mentors. You need to find people who have been there, done that. And, and doctors in our training are very good at that. We're, we're an apprenticeship training model. That's how graduate education works. Where at Colorado, I do a lot of that. So in working with scientists, engineers, health professionals, it's an entre- it's a, a, uh, an apprenticeship model. So you find somebody, it's like Benjamin Franklin. You find somebody to teach you how to print. It's the same thing in healthcare. You sign up for medical school or you go to residency and you work under people who mentor you until you are independent. Same deal in entrepreneurship. You find people who can help you. And again, there there are multiple ways of doing it and multiple kinds of people that you may need. Um, So education, networks, mentors, uh, peer-to-peer support. There aren't a whole lot of folks that are doing what I'm suggesting you do. So you're, uh, it's lonely. You're out there, there's not a big tribe. So you have to connect with people who are doing this. Fortunately, more and more people are doing it. And you can, uh, you can um, benefit from their mistakes like you're doing now in this, con- in this conversation. <clears throat> and finally, you need career development guidance because the way you became a bioengineer, an organic chemistry researcher, or a family practice doctor is very different than how you become an entrepreneur or work in the entrepreneurial world. Um, so you need to, you need to, now, 
So most of those things with the exception of experience, you can do in your spare time. And that's what I would suggest you do. You start building entrepreneurial habits. You start reading books. You start getting newsletters. You start expanding your networks on social media. And then little by little, you put your toe in the water and you start to get some experience. And to the point, we only have 24 hours in a day. So I would start with finding a relationship or a role with a company that allows you to test the water. It works for both sides. And the simplest thing to do is say, look, I'm interested in working with you, Mr. AI Digital Health Company. If you need my expertise as a subject matter expert in family medicine, I'm available for an hour uh, and I'm happy to participate. And my fee for doing this is 250 bucks an hour. Just pick a number and start somewhere and see how you like it. If that works, maybe you can do more of it. But you have to kind of under, you know, so think big, start small and uh, just put your toe in the water. I will tell you that making this pivot, you know, most of the docs on this program here have gone to medical school for four years. They've done three or four years of residency. Maybe they've done two or three years of fellowship. It takes a long time to get to do what we know how to do. It's not any easier or faster as a physician entrepreneur. It's going to take you many months, if not years, to evolve into a position where you are actually good and qualified to do what the company expects you to do. So I'd start early. Does that help? Can you still hear me? We yes, hear we you and there are no other questions in the Q&A box. Okay. Um, why don't you put up the next slide? Please. Okay, so as I mentioned, here are the things that you're gonna need to go down this road. Uh, education, resources, networks, mentors, experience, peer-to-peer -peer support, non-clinical career guidance. And just pick one. And if this is something that you wanna do or start, then just start like tomorrow and begin to educate yourself, the things that we mentioned. Um, a simple thing to do is if you are not on LinkedIn or you're not on some digital social media platform that is worth anything and that is business focused, uh, I would suggest that you revisit your LinkedIn. First of all, join LinkedIn. And if you haven't done that, you're just cutting off your nose to spite your face. And secondly, review your LinkedIn profile and look at it from the perspective of someone who may want to engage you in one of these roles. Um, and, and what do you bring to the table other than the initials after your name? And there are many, many resources. If you just Google, how do I fix my LinkedIn profile? It'll give you a million different ways to do it. Um, and just little by little, you tweak it. Um, you're, you know, like I suggested, I posted my LinkedIn profile. I'm not saying it's the best. I'm not saying it's the way you should do it. It's just an example of uh, how I approach this. Next step, the next slide. Okay, so this comes up a lot in terms of uh, what unrealistic expectations. So the expectations are from both sides. In other words, you're an AI company. You're looking to hire me or you as a domain expert, advisor, whatever. And there, there, are, there are unrealistic expectations on both sides. From the potential advisor perspective, the expectations usually have to do with what are the deliverables? What are the timelines? Um, 
how much are you going to pay me or how are you going to compensate me? Um, how long do you expect me to work for you? Is this a one-off kind of a thing or are we talking a more long-term relationship? Suppose things don't work out, then, then what's that going to look like? Um, et cetera. At, at, and at how much time are you expecting me to spend on this? You know, to the previous point, is, is this going to be a one hour or a 45 minute conversation once a month? Or are you going to expect me to be, quote, on call 24 seven? So when something happens, you're going to text me and you're going to expect me to respond to it in 20 minutes. So all of those kinds of things you have to sort of sort out. Now, from the, from the employer or the technology perspective, so let's say you're the AI entrepreneur. Um, it depends. My experience has been that a lot of startups don't do a good job engaging uh, advisors. Um, they don't, they haven't thought through all the things that I just described. They haven't thought through the ramifications of offering a compensation package. And by that, I mean, are you going to pay me by cash equity or both? And typically the startup response is going to be, well, we don't have any money to pay you. We really like what you do. We really value your input. They stroke your ego like crazy. And doctors love that because that's what we do. And then they say, we want you to work for equity. In other words, we're going to give you a part ownership. And usually it's a stock option or some sort of stock arrangement. Well, neither side really understands the ramifications of that. So if I were to offer you a job as an advisor to my AI startup, and I said, I'm going to give you equity, and you say, great, because you're thinking you're going to cash out and be like a billionaire, like early investors in Google. Well, first of all, the likelihood that this company is going to survive is about, 90, is about 3%, maybe 2%. The 50% the 50 the five-year survival rate of a startup is 50%. Any startup, when you talk about healthcare, it's less. So the likelihood that you're actually going to do this work and actually see anything for it other than intangible benefits is slim to none. So you have to kind of understand that when you go into this thing. And oh, by the way, if you're an orthopedic surgeon or an ENT surgeon like I am or a neurosurgeon, and you're making 450 or 600 or pick a number thousand dollars a year. And you think that if you're going to like migrate to being an advisor to a tech startup, you're going to make the same amount of money. You're kidding yourself. It's not going to happen. Now it could, but the likelihood of it happening is pretty slim. So I think you have to understand all these expectations and they have to be clearly defined and understood in writing. Because, you know, no, everybody's all chummy and kumbaya, and let's make this happen and change sick care until there's money on the table. Then everybody says, well, you agreed to do this, this, and that. And then the other person said, no, I didn't. Well, if you don't have something, now I'm not necessarily suggesting you have an 18-page uh, advisory service agreement with a bunch of legalese, which is what's going to happen with some people. But you do have to have the basics in writing. You agreed that this is what I'm being hired to do. Here's how, you're, what are your expectations in terms of deliverables? Here's how I'm going to be compensated and measured. And just put it in writing and put it in a file. Because this could Five years from now, they may have a financing event, but nobody really remembered who agreed to what, if you're still around. So that's what I mean by unrealistic expectations. Are there any questions about that?
Okay, so I say so, Luca. Do you want to? Do you want to uh, 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 answer or ask your question on on uh, your microphone? Yes, of course. Uh, hi. Um, hi. I'm, hi. Can you tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, actually, I'm a medical student in my final year, um, but uh, Where? I, in Italy. Uh -huh. Where in Italy? Uh, Milan. Milan. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. And I have a strong interest in, uh, of course, in, uh, um, uh, in technology and also in uh, entrepreneurship. But my, my yeah. question is uh, um, how to deal with uh, investors who yeah, understand the value of the vision, but you know all little importance to details uh, that are not to actual details. For instance, uh, ethics, data concerns, and long-term uh, ROI. So, because I've recently read an article that is uh, about, uh, for instance, is about uh, how private equity is ruining healthcare, but it uh, also account it also accounts uh, uh, venture capitalists and angels. And uh, because I think that they focus on uh, short terms, uh, uh, return on, on investments and healthcare actually mm, is not suitable for these kind of metrics when, uh, when um, evaluating a, a project, uh, when, uh, when trying to, to create something valuable for patients. Okay, so that's a good question. So now we're talking about how do you, in bigger terms, how do you reconcile the ethics and values of medicine with the ethics and values of business? Exactly. And uh, that is a difficult question. And, and it's very personal. Now, when you say that measuring the ROI of a technology from either private equity or investors or whatever is not appropriate. Of course it's appropriate. That's why they're doing it. I mean, they wouldn't be in the business of funding startups in healthcare unless part, a large part of the equation was how much money are we gonna make? So again, this has to do with the clinical versus the entrepreneurial mindset. So the answer is there are multiple stakeholders. There are patients, there are physicians, there are payers, there are product develop, there are investors. Everyone wants something different out of this enterprise. It is not unusual. In fact, you're not gonna get any money unless you get your head into their head, at least in some part. How are you going to make money for them? Now, is that why you became a medical student? Probably not. But if you, if you decide that you want to go down this road and be a physician entrepreneur, you're going to have to understand the mindset of investors. And people, you can't get to the goal line in most of these enterprises without outside funding. Sure, you can occasionally, but in most instances, it depends, of course, on whether we're talking $100,000 to build something at a hackathon and launch it versus billions of dollars and years to develop a COVID vaccine. They're different timelines. So I can't give you the answer but my answer is what I call compassionate capitalism. In other words, if, if you're going to be a, if you're going to be a capitalist entrepreneur, I don't know any doctor who hasn't taken care of patients for free. It's simply what we do. You, but you can't do it forever. And I've worked in multiple platforms, safety net hospitals, the VA, Indian Health Service, indigent care clinics, you name it, where the vast majority at some part of my career was free. 
I got paid as a paid, you know, relatively, I got paid as a surgeon in a hospital to take care of predominantly non-paying patients. Everybody does that. It's part of the game. It's what we do as physicians, but no margin, no mission. You can't do that forever. And we're seeing that now in COVID. Physicians are going out of practice. Hospitals are turning, you know, going out of practice. They're out of business. Things are consolidating. So you have to you have to balance the two. And how you do that, I think, is a pretty personal decision. But to say that it's inappropriate for somebody else to, to factor money into the technology development equation, I think is being naive. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. I haven't said that it's not appropriate. I've said that the short term ROI, I think that are not appropriate as uh, long term ROI uh, in healthcare. So what? I, what I well, it depends. Just... It depends on the business model. Yeah. So okay. If I, mis yeah. if I misinterpreted you, I'm sorry. I apologize. But yeah, yeah. I think that's your... of, of course yeah, but... uh, investments are crucial, and of course uh, uh, revenue are important and that's that's why uh that's why you start a business so that that's a business so uh that it's incredibly important to focus the revenue and to focus the, the financing right but the the only thing is that uh, uh, when trying to cut uh, the costs i think that it's important to have an insight in the domain the industry in order to understand where to cut the costs appropriately otherwise if you just focus on uh, Shorter, shorter uh, return on investment uh, right. without considering where to cut. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's incorrect, especially in healthcare, I think. All right. So you mentioned private equity specifically, and I'll give you an example. So uh, in fact, my nephew is an oncologist. Um, he ran a fairly profitable practice, private practice, had a bunch of oncologists, thriving practice. Um, he was affiliated with a university academic medical group that decided we're going to get, we're going to roll it up. We're going to acquire you. And this applies particularly in some specialties like dermatology and cardiology, a lot of private equity consolidation. So if you're a member of a, of a private practice and a private equity group approaches you, the boots on the ground, you know, rubber meets the road kind of decision is, do you sell? And that is going to include or, or basically be determined by a cost benefit of the group in terms of what's that going to look like on the other side and what are the tangible and intangible issues as you brought up. Now, if you get bought by private equity, for the most part, are they interested in delivering the usual good patient care, you know, the usual stuff, quality, experience, blah, 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 sure. But they're not doing this because they're saints. They're doing it because they want to flip, they want to fix and flip the practice. And that's okay. Maybe the practice needs to be fixed and flipped. Maybe it's very inefficient and doing stuff they shouldn't do or not doing things they should do. But you have to make that decision. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't paint private equity with this broad brush of they're the enemy. I just think you, you know, information is power. So you need to understand the changing environment, the reality of the situation, the fact that, you know what, you may not be able to sustain your private practice in the brave new world in the face of particularly major, like Milan. Now, I don't know what's happening and maybe you can educate us is, is because it's a different uh, system, but is there hospital consolidation going on in Milan? Is there practice consolidation going on in Milan? Yes, there are. Okay. Because, I mean, I've, I've worked with a bunch of folks in Europe and, and you know, it's, it's not just one single payer system. There's a lot of private practice going on. 
in, in almost every system. So in particular, so for example, in the UK, something like 20% of the revenue, 15% of the gross revenue in healthcare comes from private hospitals, not the NHS. So the same, the same dynamic is playing out and it's a global phenomenon. Um, so that, that, I don't know whether that answered your question, but I think the question was, what do we, you know, why does private, what do we do about the short-term needs of private equity versus the long-term goal of trying to advance an innovation that helps patients? Exactly. That, that was the question. Thank you okay, for the so answer. It, it, in some instances, it's not an either or, because if, you know, look at how much money and how long it takes to get a drug to a patient. They're not looking for an immediate bang for the buck. They're, they're looking for the long term. On the other hand, particularly in digital health, it tends to be more of a limited short term timeline where the, the, the model up until recently, it's a changing a little bit, is put up a website, get as many eyeballs in front of the screen as possible and scale it, demonstrate traction and exit. And that could take anywhere from eight to 15 months, not years and years and years to get a drug to market. So it really depends on where you're playing and, and the timeline. Hey, Arlen, uh, Anthony took care of the last question, which you can look at and respond also offline. Uh, it's, you got one minute. Okay, so uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Um, I would encourage you to uh, educate yourself and kind of do a little introspection. I'm always available uh, to, uh, to discuss this further. And in fact, uh, we have office hours, I think the first Friday of every month on this platform, specifically talking about these entrepreneurship issues. So I appreciate your attention and your questions and wish you the best of luck.